inhabitants of Canada. The army under my command has invaded your country. The United States offers you peace, liberty, and security. Your choice lies between these and war, slavery, and destruction. We are engaged in an awful and eventful contest. We may teach the enemy this lesson. That a country defended by free men, enthusiastically devoted to the cause of their king and constitution, can never be conquered. Prepare to receive the Americans! We know them to have always been the enemy of the Aboriginal nations. We shall participate in the shout of victory or in the grave. At the dawn of the 19th century in Canada, there is an unmistakable sense that war is approaching. In 1812, the world's great powers look upon Canada as a prize, a land of limitless resources and unparalleled potential. The territory is Great Britain's, a crucial source of timber to build the ships of the Royal Navy. Canada is the largest outpost of the British Empire. The American neighbors to the south covet Canada's vast reserves of farmland. Many Americans believe it is their destiny to control the entire continent of North America. that the United States should seize Canada is a logical first step to that destiny. Declare, O Muse, in what ill-fated hour sprung the fierce strife from what offended power. A leading role in the defense of Canada would be played by a general with a taste for history and poetry, for epic stories of ancient heroism. The letters of Isaac Brock foretell a titanic struggle of his own role in it. I wish you to send me some choice authors in history, particularly ancient with maps, and the best translations of ancient works. I read in my youth Pope's translation of Homer, but till lately never discovered its exquisite beauties. Now on the field Ulysses stands alone, the Greeks all fled, the Trojans pouring on. But stands collected in himself and whole, and questions thus, his unconquered soul. To die or conquer proves a hero's heart, and knowing this, I know a soldier's part. General Brock was born on the British Channel island of Guernsey, off the coast of France. He is brought up to be fluent in English, French, and the art of war. At St. Peter's, 
where the Brock family has worshipped for generations. He is remembered as one of 14 children, the one given the biblical name Isaac. For Isaac Brock, the notions of king and country come early. In 1802, after service in Europe, Isaac Brock sails off to find his glory in the British Army, dispatched to hold the last remaining British territories in North America. Early letters home reflect a pleasure in his new command, but a restlessness in a country not yet at war. We've been uncommonly gay the last fortnight. Races, country and water parties have occupied our time in a continued round of festivity. Such stimulus is highly necessary to keep our spirits afloat. I have a thousand thanks to offer you. The different articles arrived in the very best order. And with the exception of the cocked hat, which has not been received, a most distressing circumstance, as uh, from the enormity of my head, I find the utmost difficulty in getting a substitute in this country. In 1812, Brock's command encompasses the immense territory of Upper Canada, with a population of only 80,000. The people of the First Nations, European settlers, and exiles from the American Revolution. If war comes, no one is sure on which side any of them will fight. In the 25 years since the American Revolution, the United States is prospering and growing rapidly. The U.S. Congress now represents a nation seven and a half million strong. The spirit of the Republic is captured by a rising generation of military officers, men like Winfield Scott. The young soldier had heard the bugle and the drum. It was the music that awoke ambition. In Europe, England and France are once again at war. Throughout the continent, massive armies clash in a continuous struggle. One advantage England maintains is unchallenged domination of the seas. British ships are able to blockade European ports to starve Napoleon of supplies, but at sea, the British make a fateful error. The British constantly stop and search American ships, not only to enforce the trade blockade, but to seize American sailors and force them into the British Navy. The British declare the men are deserters. In 1812, the United States issues an ultimatum to Great Britain. If the naval harassment of American shipping does not stop, the United States will go to war. The British government does not take the American threat seriously. In Canada, General Brock is not so sure. What will be the result of our present unsettled relations with the neighboring republic? It is very difficult to say. The government is composed of such unprincipled men that to calculate on it by the ordinary rules of action would be perfectly absurd. <laughs> the United States, Britain's most vulnerable point is her vast territory in Canada. Most of England's forces are committed to the battles in Europe. There are few to spare for garrison duty in North America. To defend over 600,000 square miles of land, there are fewer than 9,000 British and Canadian regulars. All out for parade! At the forts in Upper Canada, there are only 1,700 troops to protect nearly 1,000 miles of border with the United States. General Brock has been pleading with London for more troops, but to no avail.
As war nears, British reinforcements are not forthcoming. Brock is forced to turn elsewhere for support. He needs to reawaken an alliance with England's oldest partners in North America, the First Nations. To do so, he must overcome suspicion and distrust. Many native chiefs in Canada see the British as fair-weather friends. Mohawk war chief John Norton was educated in Scotland and kept a detailed journal. Experience has convinced us of their neglect, except when they want us. Why should we endanger the comfort, even the existence of our families, to enjoy their smiles only when they need us? One key native leader sees things very differently. Oh. The Shawnee war chief Tecumseh has traveled thousands of miles around North America, pleading with other First Nations to unite against the Americans. Tecumseh sees no other way to stop illegal seizures of Indian land by the United States. At first, they asked only for land sufficient for a wigwam, but nothing now will satisfy them. But the whole of our hunting grounds, from the rising to the setting sun. General Brock despaired that he might ever conclude a useful alliance with the native leaders. That changed in the summer of 1812, when he met Tecumseh for the first time at his forward headquarters in Amherstburg, Upper Canada. I'm proud to greet so powerful an ally. Welcome, Tecumseh. In which? All in attendance recorded that Brock was astonished by the eloquence of Tecumseh. We, your Indian allies, are overjoyed that our father beyond the Great Salt Lake, the King, has at last awoke from his long sleep and permitted his warriors to come to the assistance of his red children. The Americans came on us suddenly and destroyed our villages and slew our warriors. They came to us hungry and they cut off the hands of our brother who gave them corn. We offered them rivers of fish and they poisoned our springs. We gave them mountains covered with forests, valleys full of game. And what did they give us in return? Rum, trinkets, and a grave. On our part, we will shed the last drop of blood in service of our father, the king. The king. The king. The native leaders were in turn impressed by General Brock. The decisive manner in which General Brock spoke and acted was a very favorable feature. He was a man of discernment, candor, and rectitude. Splendid. At this meeting, General Brock makes a solemn undertaking on behalf of His Majesty's government. If the native people join with the British to save Canada, the British will support their demand for an independent native country in North America. Brock wrote to the British government to underline the importance of the commitment. I have already been asked to pledge my word that England would enter into no negotiation in which their interests were not included. And could they be brought to imagine that we should desert them? The consequences must be fatal. Only if we unite against the long knives can we prevail. Only then will the maker of life help us in our cause. War is coming between the long knives and our British father. If we side with the British in the coming battles, we will gain our country. In Washington, war fever is now rampant, ignited by leaders such as former President Thomas Jefferson. 
He declares that the capture of Canada will be a mere matter of marching. Those for war are called war hawks. Their Republican leader in Congress, Henry Clay, declares, we have the Canadas as much under our command as Great Britain has the ocean. I would take the whole continent from them. God has given us the power. Richard Johnson of Kentucky declares the conquest of Canada is part of America's destiny. Andrew Jackson, who will play a fateful role in the war, stakes out America's position. We are going to fight for the reestablishment of our national character, for the protection of our maritime citizens impressed on board British ships of war, to vindicate our right to free trade, now perishing, and to settle, once and for all, the Indian question by the conquest of all of the British dominions upon the continent of North America. June 18th, 1812, the United States officially declares war against Great Britain. The news travels north by Voyageur, taking a week to reach Canada's capital at Fortress Quebec. The event is captured in the diary of Anne Prevost, daughter of the governor. June 25th. I was summoned in the midst of my French lesson to hear some news that had arrived. America has declared war against England. The principal object of the government of the United States must be the conquest of Canada. Mr. Madison flatters himself he has just seized the fortunate moment when he might pluck the jewel out of England's crown. Canada's Commander-in-Chief, Sir George Prevost, is a cautious man. Realizing his precarious position, he now wants to avoid provoking the Americans. Prevost immediately dispatches orders to General Brock in Upper Canada to avoid any offensive measures whatsoever. Our numbers would not justify offensive operations being undertaken unless they were solely calculated to strengthen a defensive attitude. I consider it prudent and politic to avoid any such measures which, in effect, have a tendency to unite the people of the American states. The first effect of the American declaration of war is division in the British camp. General Brock is astonished by his orders from Prevost and immediately informs the commander-in-chief of his descent. He wants to move quickly to the attack. The accounts received of war having been declared by the United States against Great Britain justify offensive operations. The morning of July 12, 1812. Inhabitants of Canada, the army under my command has invaded your country. The standard of the United States waves on the territory of Canada. General William Hull, the 61-year-old governor of Michigan, commands the first ever invasion by the United States Army onto foreign soil. The United States offers you peace, liberty, and security. Your choice lies between these and war, slavery, and destruction. In the vanguard of the invasion force is the 4th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army, experienced soldiers who have already fought against the Indians of the Northwest. There is also a ragtag mix of militia units from Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, even some from as far away as the Carolinas. The barbarous and savage policies of Great Britain be pursued, and the savages let loose to murder our citizens and butcher our women and children, this war will be a war of extermination. No white man, fond fighting by the side of an Indian, 
will be taken prisoner. Very good, sir. The American invasion force has penetrated Upper Canada at the far western end of Lake Erie, just south of Detroit. On the first day, the Americans crossed the Detroit River to occupy the Canadian town of Sandwich, almost without opposition. General Brock is determined to rally both the citizens of Upper Canada and the native population to his side. He devises a bold strategy. With all haste, Lieutenant. In direct contravention of his orders from Governor General Prevost, Brock decides to move to the offensive. Brock dispatches a handful of voyageurs and a British officer on a desperate mission. These men must paddle almost 750 miles in one week. The voyageurs keep a pace of 45 strokes a minute. Speed is of the essence, and so is secrecy. This small force has been ordered to arrange a key surprise attack. From Fort George, the voyageurs cross Lake Ontario to York, methodically making their way up the Humber River, portaging and paddling to Georgian Bay, onwards to the top of Lake Huron, to the strait which leads into Lake Michigan. Their objective is a crucial American stronghold, Fort Mackinac. Fort Mackinac is one of the keys to controlling the Great Lakes. It holds a commanding view of the strait below. All ships moving between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron must pass under its heavy cannons. Just as Brock has calculated, the American officers in the fort have no idea that war has been declared and so are totally unprepared for any attack. Forty miles away at the British Fort St. Joseph, the attacking force picks up armaments, more than 500 Indian warriors, and the armed schooner, Caledonia. Under cover of darkness, the attackers cross Lake Huron and surround Fort Mackinac. When the British unveil their threat to destroy the fort and kill everyone inside, the shock value is astounding. The American fort is instantly surrendered. I have the honor to transmit herewith a dispatch this instant received from Captain Roberts, announcing the surrender of Fort Michel Mackinac. The capture of Mackinac may produce great changes to the westward. The actual invasion of the province justifies every act of hostility on the American territory. General Brock has his first victory and sails off with another force to confront the American invaders at the western end of Lake Erie. General, with all due respect, On the western front, we have General Hull and his American invasion force has stalled. We can take that fort down right now. Let us fire and get it done. Hull's officers are pressing for an attack on the British Fort Malden, but Hull suffers a fit of nerves and seems paralyzed by indecision. We can take it down right 
News of the capture of Fort Mackinac to the north has shaken General Hull's confidence. He retreats back to Fort Detroit. In private letters to the Secretary of War in Washington, the general confides a fear that he is now vulnerable to massive and vicious attacks from native warriors. Join in the war of extermination. I have every reason to expect, in a very short time, a large body of savages whose operations will be directed against this army. General Hull has also become obsessed with his long supply lines leading back into the United States. His fears are not totally misplaced. Tecumseh prepares an ambush with 50 attackers. Although they are outnumbered four to one, they pounce. <laughs> In early August, the warriors make two assaults on the Americans south of Detroit, killing and wounding dozens. The Americans are terrified by the taking of scalps. General Hull has also suffered one other astonishing piece of bad planning and bad luck. He has placed a trunkload of his secret military papers, including his letters to Washington, on board a schooner named Cuyahoga on Lake Erie. But the American forces do not control the lake. The British troops are everywhere. The Cuyahoga is not a warship, so its defenses are negligible. The British take possession of some of the Americans' most vital military secrets. General Brock now knows that the Americans have vastly overestimated the strength of the forces they are facing, and that they are especially afraid of Indian attacks. He makes maximum use of the information. He prepares an invasion force to cross the Detroit River. He sends Hull a threatening letter aimed right at the American general's greatest fear. It is far from my inclination to join in a war of extermination. But you must be aware of the numerous body of Indians who have attached themselves to my troops will be beyond control the moment the contest commences. It's a bluff. Hull doesn't know it, but he commands a force more than double his British opponent. Even his artillery is more powerful. But when Brock's guns open up, Hull refuses to fire back. Hull is afraid that all the inhabitants of the fort, including his daughter and two grandchildren, will be slaughtered. Intimidated, fearful, and with his own officers circulating a petition against him, Hull decides on capitulation. America's army of invasion marches out to surrender. 2,500 officers and men with as many rifles and muskets 39 cannon and a long supply train gives up to a force half that size. 
America's outrage is expressed by one of the next generation of U.S. officers, Winfield Scott. The patriots stirred with indignation at the deplorable loss of national character, life, and property sustained by whole surrender shall ask at every turn, what? Shall not fatuity, ignorance, incapacity, imbecility, call it what you may, and a commander, whatever the rank, be equally punished with cowardice or given aid and comfort to the enemy? General Hull is taken prisoner and held for several months in Canada, then sent back to the United States. There he is tried and convicted of cowardice and sentenced to be hanged. President Madison commutes the sentence, but Hull goes into history as the author of one of America's greatest military disgraces. After his audacious victory at Detroit, General Brock is the toast of the British Empire. Not only has he built a powerful alliance with the First Nations, but in 19 days, he has defeated the main body of the U.S. Army. In Lower Canada, Sir George Prevost knows that Brock has disobeyed his orders, but in the circumstances, decides not to make an issue out of it. He expresses grudging approval of Brock's strategy. I can assure you of my perfect confidence in your measures for the preservation of Upper Canada. All your wants shall be supplied as fast as possible, except for money, of which I have so little. Haste, man, haste. Now at the peak of his power and fame, Isaac Brock feels a nagging, troubling premonition, which he confines only to those closest to him. If this war lasts, I fear I shall do some foolish thing. General Brock boldly declares that the entire Michigan Territory has been reattached to Canada. Both British and Indian leaders see this as a possible future independent native nation. Brock knows that he owes his victory in large measure to Tecumseh and pays the Shawnee chief his highest compliment. Miss Elliot, gentlemen, I give you Tecumseh. Wellington of the Indians. The United States has lost a key battle, but it is far from losing the war. The American population is 15 times that of Canada. The Americans have more money, more weapons, and now they are looking to avenge their humiliation at Fort Detroit. Step. Step. The American army begins to regroup on the New York side of the Niagara River, near the falls. On the other side of the Niagara River, General Brock begins amassing his troops in response. He knows that his forces will be dramatically outnumbered and outgunned, and that the Americans are unlikely to be bluffed again. It will be critical for him to anticipate where the Americans will try to cross the river and when. number of troops which have been this day added to the strong force previously collected on the opposite side convinces me, along with other indications, that an attack is not far distant. You will hear of some decisive action in the course of a fortnight. I say decisive because if I should be beaten, the province is inevitably gone. Brock anticipates that the attack might come anywhere along the Niagara River, from Fort Erie in the south 
to Fort George in the north. In fact, it is at Queenston Heights, just north of the falls that the Americans cross on October 13th, 1812, in the early morning. pulling hard through swirling water and the sweeping current. Winfield Scott was there. In crossing about daylight, the boats had to sustain a direct plunging fire from the battery on the heights. Fire! Alone, General Brock races out of his headquarters at Fort George, headed for the cannons he can hear from Queenston. He leaves orders to follow with the regiment as soon as possible. Every minute counts. When I arose, I saw General Brock riding up the road. I ran immediately to the camp. A cannonade commenced, which roused the spirits of the warriors. All ran towards Queenston. In battle since time immemorial, armies try to seize the high ground, to bring their weapons to bear on the enemy below. In fierce combat, the Americans capture the British cannon at the top of Queenston Heights. The disgrace of Hull's recent surrender was deeply felt by all Americans. Those at Queenston Heights resolved to sustain the shock of the enemy. Gathering the Redcoats, Brock is just as determined to retake the heights. Brock had often said that he would never ask men to go where he would not lead them. He gathers a small force and personally launches the charge. A U.S. Army rifleman spots the General's scarlet tunic and cocked hat. Hearing that Brock is down, the Mohawks burst from the woods with terrifying war cries and charge the heights. That sound echoes across the river and is heard by the U.S. militia units about to embark as the second wave of attack. The American volunteers are frozen with fear and come up with a constitutional reason not to proceed any further. These vermin who infest all republics, boastful enough at home, no sooner found themselves inside of the enemy than they discovered that the militia of the United States could not be constitutionally marched into a foreign country. Because of the American militia's refusal to cross the river, the first wave of the U.S. Army attackers is now stranded on the Canadian side. The main body of the British and Canadian forces arrives and advance relentlessly with withering fire and fixed bayonets. In the smoke and confusion of battle, the Americans found it difficult to get their bearings. Under the threat of the scalping knife, the tomahawk, and the fire of the British regulars, the Americans began to withdraw. But where? Behind were the cliffs and the whirlpool and the deep rushing waters of the Niagara River. Firings on both sides were deadly. And then followed a partial clash of bayonets. The Americans, by force of overwhelming numbers, were driven from the heights toward the river. Here, all was seized with despair. No boats had arrived. A formal surrender was made on terms honorable 
to all parties. The grief caused by the death of General Brock threw a gloom over the sensations which this brilliant success might have raised. After the battle, the body of Major General Isaac Brock is brought back along the river road for requiem services. Even his American adversaries feel a sense of occasion. The remains of General Brock were buried with all honors of war in the bastion of Fort George. Lieutenant Colonel Scott, out of respect for the very high character of the deceased, sent across a request to the American fort opposite Niagara to fire minute guns during the British solemnities. Thus there was a long, continuous roar of American and British cannon in honor of a fallen hero. Express brought news of the Battle of Queenston and the death of our noble defender, General Brock. This excellent officer was only too prodigal of life. If he had but reserved his personal exertions till the reinforcements came up, which ultimately drove back the invaders, his country may have had him still. For Tecumseh and the Indian people, the death of General Brock is devastating. Not only have they lost the one British leader they trusted, they lost the representative of His Majesty's government who made them the promise of a homeland of their own. News of the death of General Brock sweeps across the country and over the ocean. Throughout Great Britain, church bells peal for him. On Brock's ancestral island of Guernsey, the shield and crest of the family is changed, reflecting pride in the fateful alliance he made with the First Nations. In the family church, a lasting testament is carved over the altar In Canada, at Queenston Heights, overlooking the Niagara River and the American shore, near the spot where he fell in battle, a massive monument is raised to honor the memory of Isaac Brock, the general who saw his destiny in the lines of ancient poetry. Now on the field Ulysses stands alone, the Greeks all fled, the Trojans pouring on. but stands collected in himself and whole, and questions thus his unconquered soul. To die or conquer proves a hero's heart, and knowing this, I know a soldier's part. Me Greece shall honor when I meet my doom, with solemn funerals and a lasting tomb.